my name's Neil, as you mentioned, and I have a, a YouTube channel, which is YouTube slash RMC Retro, on which we celebrate retro computers, games, software, and uh, and consoles as well. It's a, it's a celebration of all of those retro systems. Um, I've been YouTubing for about three years now, full time for one year. And uh, the majority of what I do revolves around the YouTube videos, but I also do occasional live streams. I released a book in 2020. I released a vinyl record in 2020. All of these things are tangents that have grown out of the success of the YouTube channel and the community that's grown around it. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we all just celebrate the culture and the evolution of the home computer and game industry. So it was in 20, January of 2017 that I started making the videos. And my goal at that point was to connect with other people with the same interests as me. I didn't know anyone who was into retro computing. I knew people who were into football. I knew people who were into going to the pub and drinking. I didn't know anyone who had any interest in an Amstrad CPC or a ZX Spectrum in 2017. So it was just an attempt to connect with people. And uh, from the off, from the comments in the comment section on the videos, I immediately started getting that, that really great feedback. Uh, and that connection with similar minded people. So that's why um, I did it in 2017. And then it was in 2020 when I went full time. So January 2020, uh, three years through to going full time and uh, it being self supportive. Yeah. Tell me, how, how did that process happen and, and why did it happen? Yeah, yeah. Well, the reason it happened is because it became self-supportive. So I could actually pay myself a wage. I, I hate calling it a full-time job. It still very much feels like a hobby. And I, I try to keep it feeling like a hobby uh, because I would hate to, it started as a hobby. I don't want to ruin my hobby <laughs> by turning it into a job. But yeah, it's self-supportive. Uh, and it happened because of uh, monetization through YouTube adverts that's quite a small proportion because you don't get a huge amount from YouTube advertising. Uh, Patreon is my main source of income and then external sponsors. So that's how the monetization came together. Patreon came about originally just because one of the viewers asked me, how can I support you? How can I give you a tip? Have you ever thought of using Patreon? Um, I'm a big user of Patreon now and supporter of other channels. Back then, I, I, I don't think I was even aware of Patreon in 2017. So a, a viewer made me aware of it. My very first patron was a, a guy called Dustin in Texas in the USA. Uh, and it just slowly snowballed from there over the years. So um, that that's that's grown. At, today, as we speak, I think I've got 1,024 patrons that have slowly and steadily grown over those years. So it was a real surprise to see that growth. Uh, and, and breaking the thousand patron barrier is a huge deal. It's a huge deal for channels, um, more so probably than breaking 100,000 YouTube subscribers because it's that core dedicated viewership of a thousand patrons that take you into to a position where you have to think less about income. You know, you've got a good income, you've got the rent for this studio and all of the tools and everything covered, and you can have more brain space for creativity than worrying about where the money's going to come from. So a thousand patrons, a big, big deal, and uh, very excited to have hit it this year, yeah. Uh, could you tell me what was the key factor to your first 10 patrons? Uh, how did it start? How did the snowball come to roll? And and do you have any, do you have any tips for someone who has never been even in contact with Patreon before. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. um, well, the first ones got off the ground because as soon as people started asking me to do Patreon, uh, I started mentioning it in my videos. You can have viewers out there who are just 100% dedicated into your, to your channel and what you do. But unless you give them a call to action, they might not even think, oh, can I support this person? Can I become a patron. So as soon as I started mentioning in the credits at the end of my video, if you really support, if you really like this channel, why not consider becoming a patron? And that just that little call to action, which wasn't too intrusive. It wasn't like a, an advert in the middle that chopped up the production. It was just a subtle, if you like this, why not become a patron voiceover at the end? That call to action really worked and it works to this day. I still do that. So um, 
if you don't ask, you don't get, you know, don't be afraid. And, and being British, it's very, um, uh, it goes against the grain to talk about money or to ask for money. Uh, yeah. it, it's just in our psyche. I don't know how it is in other countries, but it's very much a part of being British is, is you don't ask for help. You don't ask for money. You don't ask for directions when you're lost in your car. <laughs> um, <laughs> So it, it was difficult to say that, but as soon as I, I did start asking, if you want to help the channel become a Patreon, people did. So the first thing, piece of advice I would give is, is to ask. And then the second thing, as you say, people just want to support. It's not necessarily about getting physical rewards. At the very start, I offered a um, Patreon level that comes with a gift box. I have about 34 people at the moment that are on that gift box level. And mm -hmm. actually... Nobody ever talks about it. Nobody's really that interested in the gift box. There's not a real uh, desire for physical rewards. So if I went back and did it again, I wouldn't worry about the physical rewards. I really wouldn't. Yeah. In terms of demographics, surprisingly, it is not the youngsters who sign up on my channel. It's, it's the older audience. Um, they're far more likely to put their hand in their pocket from my experience. And also anecdotally from speaking to other YouTubers. And I don't think that's because of an unwillingness from a younger audience. It's just, they're less financially secure. You, you know, our younger generation are having a harder time than ever to get a fair wage, to buy a house, to have financial security for retirement. So it, it doesn't surprise me that it's reflected in that, in that demographic. My main demographic on my channel are predominantly male, 30 to 55 year olds so mm -hmm. they're really in their prime earning age um so you know two pound fifty five pounds a, a month isn't a big deal to them you know but for mm -hmm. the youngsters that can make all the difference so yeah no don't don't assume it's it's just young people that sign up for this stuff It's a more traditional method of, of getting an income than Patreon. And uh, it's quite an easy one to answer with sponsorship because a sponsor, they want to be associated with success and they want to talk directly to who they see as their target demographic. So I've told you who my demographic are. And, and of course, they also have a, an interest in retro computers. So that attracts both businesses who operate in the retro market, like Monster Joysticks. They sell joysticks for retro computers. So that's a natural fit but also one-click print who have nothing to do with retro whatsoever, but they recognize that the demographic I have, male 30 to 55, they want to target for whatever reason, whatever's in their business plan, they recognize that. So it doesn't have to be retro sponsors that are coming to work with you or computer sponsors. Mm. So long as um, they know what your demographic is, then fine. If you can, in my experience, if you can find a company who you can align with, who will give you that long-term income, even if you, they're paying you a bit lower, th then that's really valuable. Um, but yeah, it really is. The patrons really are the bulk of my income. Um, and, that, and that's a completely different story. That's all about a sense of belonging, a sense of finding your retro home. That's what that's all about. Uh, so yeah. But, but you know, it's good to spread the risk, isn't it? It's good to have all of these pots, YouTube, ad revenue, income, sponsors, mm -hmm. Patreons. You, you've got to spread it all out. Yeah. Is, there, is there a lot of sponsors that go for that long-term relationship? And is it hard to build them? Or, or do you rather be lucky to find them? Um, I don't know. Yeah. I think the longer term sponsors come once you're a bit more established and you're, you're showing that you're releasing videos week in, week out, and you're reliable and you're committed to what you're doing. Yep. In the shorter term, um, you might look for opportunities where you can ask a company if you can show off their product. And then if that product sells, you can get a percentage of the sales. Mm. I avoid that now um, because it can infringe on your, on your content. You know, it's very important to keep your channel's integrity. And if anyone gets any, a slightest whiff, if they think that you're showing something with the purpose of making money from your audience uh, and not just for showing it what it is, then you can lose your integrity very quickly. Really, if you're starting out, the most important thing is just to make content and to build an audience 
and think about the sponsorship and the money a little bit further down the line. If your intention from the start is to make money, then you're probably doing it for the wrong reasons. <laughs> you're probably running your channel for the wrong reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Have you have you had negative reactions to sponsored videos or um, no, no, no. Um, uh, occasional comment if there are too many adverts in the video. Now, what I do is I have two releases of every video, the public release, which has adverts, and the Patreon release, which is ad-free, and they get it one week early. So that's a benefit that they get for being a patron. I think if you're going to go longer than 25 minutes, then you have to have a pretty seriously good production, you know. It has, to re it has to really capture people. You have to be sort of <laughs> Netflix quality, if you like, to really keep people watching. Mm -hmm. So, I, uh, you know, uh, as much as I w try to put out good quality content, I'm very aware that over 25 minutes is too much. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not in line with the free time that people have in the modern day. You have to accept that they only have a certain amount of time and yeah. you have to respect that time by giving them good, good quality content, not trying to squeeze it and make it longer just for the sake of making it longer. Mm. Just be respectful to the audience. So I think that's the sweet spot for me. Yeah. So many people are doing this that you have to be able to offer something fresh and new and different. So whenever I do a live show, I plan it to the same degree as I do a pre-recorded show. It can take me a week to plan a live show and have it all set up and, and run it mm -hmm. just to, to keep the quality high. So um, live shows for me are a nice supplement. <clears throat> and once a month, I also do a live show, which is primarily watched by the patrons on, on a second channel that I have. Mm -hmm. So that's nice. That's a nice way of connected, connecting with your most important audience and, and talking directly to them. And I also invite them to submit videos. I'll set a topic every month and they can submit a 90 second video, which we'll watch and share. And I'll, I'll comment on it's a bit like Neil reacts to your video. I think you've submitted some yourself, haven't you, on the live stream, have you? Yes. Yeah, I have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's good fun to watch these things. So I use the, the live shows as a tool to speak directly to my most important audience. It's not, it's not a source of income. It's uh, an extra layer of, um, uh, I, I guess, value for money, if you like, for the patrons. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Well, um, I have thought about this a little bit because I work with a museum called the uh, Museum of Computing in Swindon here in the UK. And they have actually just started their first steps into uh, live streaming and making and videos. And I've made videos at their museum with them. So they're just trying to find their feet as well at the moment, which, which got me thinking. And I would say if I was at a museum, I would say just to look around you, make use of what you've got. For example, if you've got a storeroom full of old computers, even if it looks like a complete mess to you, to a viewer, that looks like an adventure to see in there for the first time, you know, to pull something out of the pile and to try and bring it back to life. That's something that you've got that no YouTubers got. So make, make the most of what's around you. Um, if you've got displays in your museum, use them as a backdrop in your video just to show what you've got show it off don't be don't be afraid to show it off if people turn up to donate machines film that experience capture the joy and the kindness in the act uh mm -hmm. because that's not something that many of us experience so that's nice mm -hmm. to capture yeah. if you spend weekends even just rearranging a video game display mm -hmm. you know because you love doing that share the experience because that's a lifestyle that people would love to to have to be a part of to work in a video game museum uh, and I think if you've, if you've done that for a year or two, mm. you, you might forget how novel that is, what a nice experience that is. And, and you, want, you want to share that with people. To give you an example, the computer museum that I mentioned, they've been live streaming on Sundays, cleaning the displays. All they're doing is going around cleaning them, cleaning computers while chatting to people. And people love that. Mm. Um, so, so, yeah. Um, and then just let your personality and your museum's personality shine through. If you combine the unique space you have with a really positive, welcoming, inviting attitude and a genuine love for the subject, that's mm. infectious. Uh, I think if you want to attract 
a really genuine audience who want to contribute to what you're trying to achieve, come on the journey with you and feel a part of that journey, then you have to be genuine and you have to show the joy and the love for the topic that you have. So if you do that, people will come back again and again and again to share that joy with you and to feel like they're part of something much bigger than just a YouTube channel, feel like they're making a difference Mm -hmm. and that small contribution that they make. But when a thousand people are making that small contribution, it it really does make a big difference. So Mm -hmm. that would be my advice to any museum out there.